right. Hello, everyone. This is Conversations with Dom, brought to you by I'm Breaking Into Tech. I'm your host, Dom Gomes. Today, I'm bringing someone that has a very familiar last name. He is, in fact, my dad, John Gomes. Uh, my dad's been working in Silicon Valley for over 30 years, worked with some of the biggest names in tech, Apple, Cisco, Google. Um, and his specialty has been around software quality assurance, which is a topic that I feel like a lot of people don't know too much about. Um, so I'm just going to call you dad because you're my dad. It's going to be weird if I called you John. Sounds so good. Yeah, and I'll call you Tom, okay? <laughs> Sounds good. You don't have to call me son. They obviously know there's a connection here. But uh, but dad, why don't you you know tell the audience about your background, You know where you came from, and um, you know just uh, a little bit about yourself, and then we'll get a little bit more into your um, you know your career. Sounds good. Uh, yeah, so uh, my parents were born in Portugal, Madeira, so I'm first generation. Uh, I was born in Oakland, uh, still a Raiders fan to a certain degree and an Ace fan, but unfortunately, you know, they're off to Vegas. But anyway, um, so, uh, you know, I saw my dad. My dad worked at the GM plant in Fremont. Uh, and actually, it started in Oakland, and uh, we moved to Fremont when the plant uh, moved to Fremont. And he worked there for many years. And, uh, you know, I saw him toiling on the line. It was more of a blue collar job. And in fact, in the summertime um, and in when I was a junior in high school, I worked in the cafeteria there and I saw these guys putting in seat covers and other things. And I thought, you know what? I don't want a job like that. So I actually took the ASVAB test in high school and I scored pretty well. So the Air Force called me up and uh, I didn't have enough money for college. And I thought, you know what, I wasn't sure what I wanted to do. So I joined the Air Force and definitely it was really a good decision. I started off at Lackland basic training, went to tech school in Biloxi, Mississippi. And then I started my first assignment in Lubbock, Texas, Reese Air Force Base. And I was doing more office admin. And I actually worked in the chapel, managing the chapel. It was kind of a cool job in a sense because, uh, uh, you know, I got to meet a lot of people. The only bad thing about it, uh, I had to mow the lawn. And uh, I had I was like a one-striper, so I was kind of on the bottom of the totem pole. So I got these interesting jobs. But, you know, I learned how to type really well. These were IBM Selectric typewriters. that were We had no displays, no monitors, no computers. So... If you made a mistake on the uh, typewriter, then you'd have to use correcting, you know, uh, uh, stuff and things like that. So it was really a, a manual process. But, you know, I learned a lot um, and, you know, I learned finance. I learned other things. And I got stationed in Ankara, Turkey, and I was uh, basically supporting the embassy. So that was kind of a cool job. I ended up going to the Middle East and other things. And uh but you know what? I, I knew I didn't want to stay in the Air Force. I wanted to do more technical stuff. I knew some friends of mine who were doing computer work uh, in finance, uh, hooking up uh, their monitors up to big mainframes. So when I got out of the Air Force in 78, I started taking computer classes and, um, and you know, and it really in encouraged me to say, you know what, I can do this. And it's kind of an interesting job. I didn't realize that Silicon Valley would have turned out the way it did. And luckily, you know, I lived in Silicon Valley, uh, moved out to uh, uh, to San Jose, um, and uh, I started doing um, computer operations work. And, and the reason why I got the job is because I had a security clearance. So uh, the manager said, yeah, we'll train you because it takes a long time to get a security clearance. So I became an operator, a computer operator at TRW defense and space. And uh, we worked on the satellite subsystem for the space shuttle. So, you know, working in Silicon Valley, being in the Air Force was something that uh, the Air Force really helped me to get into the technical field. So kind of even taking it first step back, you know, after seeing what, you know, your dad or, you know, my grandfather being a first generation American working on the line, which for, for people that are listening, that plant is where Tesla is nowadays. Too. That's true. Yeah. And yeah. after GM closed, it became NUMI, uh, a joint uh, partnership with Toyota and GM. And then it closed. And then, yeah, I was happy to see Tesla took it over. So very interesting. I would like to, you know, actually visit that plant. 
one of these days and reminisce when my when my dad was there. But I know there's a lot more robotics and other things there. So technology has definitely paid uh, played a big part in uh, making the uh, electric vehicles. I, I guess after seeing what your dad was going through, again, it seemed like the, the Air Force was a good way to find that path to what you eventually wanted to do. But be, before you even got into the Air Force, did you think you were just going to follow in his footsteps potentially? Yeah, I did because in the 60s and 70s, the only places you could really go in the Bay Area was the GM plant in Fremont, the Ford plant in Milpitas, which is now the Great Mall, and then go to Lockheed or IBM, but basically blue collar jobs unless you uh, you know went to college and you know I didn't have enough money to college, so I I really I don't know I I probably if there was if the Air Force wasn't around I probably would have uh, started working at GM like my dad did. Yeah, it's it's kind of amazing how uh, certain things just can take you down a road that you didn't think, and then exactly you kind of rode the whole wave, right? And I I think that's the other thing is you kind of mentioned it because we you know we grew up you grew up in this area. Do you would have do you think you would have gotten into technology if we wouldn't have lived in, you know, the San Francisco Bay Area or Silicon Valley? Or do you um, think it was just it just became because the opportunities were here too as well? Yeah, that's a good question. I mean, depending on where, I mean, I think I've always had this thing in me to be, you know, learn, you know, new technologies and be on the leading edge of of things and especially electronics, consumer goods. So I think I still would have maybe followed in those footsteps to a certain degree, but not in the place I'm now in Silicon Valley, there's been so much opportunity in the old days, you could get jobs without degrees. You know, you needed connections and other things, but degree wasn't a big thing back then. And, you know, later on, I did get my degrees and everything else just for a, uh, you know, more of a personal goal, but way in the beginning, you really didn't need a degree, which was kind of cool because a lot of the, we were very diverse being a software tester, you know, where I was doing manual testing at a, at Atari. Uh, that's where I met your mom, you know, and, uh, you know, six children later, you know, and a grandchild. Uh, thank you, Dominic, uh, little Victor. Uh, and uh, so, uh, so yeah, it's definitely been an interesting um, area to be in Silicon Valley. Start, you know, it started off in semiconductor. You know, with yeah. the I, I, Intel's, the uh, AMDs and things like that. And then from there, it went to uh, PCs, the Apples, the Ataris, the gaming consoles and things like that. And then the Internet. And then basically it just took off after the Internet. Yeah, it's uh, it's one of those things where when I tell people who aren't from the area of, of you know, where I live, everyone's just say everyone's kind of shocked because it's it's just such a concentration of the biggest some of the biggest companies of the world essentially right it's it's right in our backyard you know with the exception of some of the stuff up in Seattle probably I would say you know right. the Microsoft and the Amazon but it, it is one of those things where I feel like now it just it's almost like the expectation if, if even if you want to live out here nowadays is you almost have to go that route which is kind of kind of insane thinking about like how expensive it's got in that sense, but, it has. but it's really provide, but it's provided us with these opportunities that are just like amazing too. So it's, it's a blessing. It and a has. Curse, you know? Well, let me tell you about the real estate market just to, you know, just give you some perspective uh, is in 79, I bought a house in Newark, you know, it's near Fremont there for 45,000. And then uh, your mom and I bought a house in the Rose garden. And I think it was 1984 for 70,000. And then we uh, we went out on a limb and bought a house in Albany Valley. I think it was in 86, 87 for 235,000. And it was a stretch. Uh, but, you know, the house prices were, were really reasonable back then. You know, a lot of people can afford a house. And now it's just very difficult. Uh, wages, you know, can't uh, match what these houses cost now in Silicon Valley. So, you know, that's a challenge for kids nowadays trying to uh, work out here. And, uh, you know, it's definitely, I think it's something that can, I think, change the future of Silicon Valley because people just can't afford coming out here if uh, they don't already have a house. Yeah, I, I, I get it. As, as Oakland homeowners, even, even where we're at the East Bay, it's not uncommon to hear people, 
again, a lot of us would be going to San Francisco, which is interesting to see how the shift went from, you know, I would say the peninsula, you know, Palo yep. Alto, Mountain yep. View, Sunnyvale, and a lot of stuff sort of moved up more towards San Francisco, which is, but then it's kind of gone away, but now it might be coming back with this whole AI boom that's happening with open AI and everything. So it's, that's it's, true. it's that's true. fascinating yeah, it, times. It is. It really is neat. Yeah, definitely chat GPT. And, uh, you know, when I worked at Google too, we were working on some AI tools. So this definitely is where things are going. But it's interesting because about 15 years ago, AI was kind of actually starting up and we and they we thought back then it was going to be a big thing, but it kind of fizzled out. And now chat GPT, when it first came out, then all the other people are now joining the bandwagon. So yeah, I definitely feel it's here to stay, but we got to be careful on the, how it plays out. Well, let's actually get into more of what you've done in the tech industry, right? So uh, maybe it might be a good idea to just give people an understanding of what quality assurance QA or testing is sort of in the software or hardware industry. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you know, it's kind of like the gate before the consumer gets the product. You know, you want to make sure that, you know, the development teams have done their due diligence and have done their unit testing. And so basically what QA does, we do system testing, we do performance testing. You know, we make sure that the product works well before the customers get it. And uh, sometimes that can be challenging. Uh, and it, it's all about time too. If you have the time to really do it right, then you're probably gonna do it right. But nowadays with the internet and with a lot of different connections and interfaces, you really have to be smart about how you test because you just don't have time to test everything. So, you know, you gotta target the risk areas as I call it, call it targeted testing and focus on those and then have automation and things like that. But basically what we do is we're the advocate for the customer and we provide the information to management to make a decision should this product be released or not. So basically we're, we're doing risk management for the, uh, for the organization. Well, and, and you must have seen what it was like before, you know, when maybe you'd have one big release and now there's people are, you know, doing, de doing deployments to production. Like, yeah. 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 I mean, you've seen How's that changed the whole landscape of like continuous integration and yeah, DevOps that, and all this stuff? That's a good question. When I worked at Apple in the 80s and 90s, we were working on System 7.0 and it was a waterfall model. And, you know, we had over a year to actually do the release. And, uh, you know, we did pretty well. You know, we, we had hundreds of testers on the product. And, uh, you know, we were getting feedback from uh, beta testers and stuff like that. So it was, it was a waterfall model, but we kept on getting feedback from uh, our customers, and uh, which, which really helped. Uh, now at Google, uh, you know, where, where I worked for almost seven years, I worked on Google Assistant. And we were doing daily releases. And uh, it got to be crazy where, yeah, you had to make sure that, you know, the, the software was good enough. So we had a lot of automation, of course, because you can't do a lot of manual testing when you're releasing every day. So we uh, we were doing uh, automation and, you know, Google had their own internal tools and things. But it was interesting. A lot of times when we really got too pushed, we released the product and then it was like, you know, we had regression, which, you know, regression means you broke something. And then the next day, <laughs> We fixed that bug and then, then we fixed some other bugs. So every day we're putting out new releases. So definitely a new kind of uh, a method and definitely DevOps where, you know, you're basically doing this uh, thing where you're, you know, uh, continuous uh, development and integration and deployment. So, yeah, it's uh, it's uh, it definitely is a lot different than uh, it is now to where the uh, you know, to the waterfall days that we've had in the past. But Agile is much better. I, I really like Agile as long as it's done properly. And, you know, you have your stand-ups and, uh, you know, everyone's talking to each other, you know, because it's clear and it's really uh, uh, a top priority. Everyone's got to be talking to get these releases out on time. Yeah, and even to take it a little bit more so people understand what what – how you guys test and what it is pretty much the cornerstone of testing is the test case 
So it's essentially like what the scenarios that you would have to run that are supposed to be the desired outcome. Right? Yes, yes. And it's basically lot... you're mimicking with how the customer is going to use it. And then you do stress testing. Okay, well, if the customer does this, what if yeah. they do that? And performance testing and, you know, um, reaction. Testing with a bunch of data. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Because, you know, you might have a good product initially, but then as your data gets larger and larger, larger your databases can get pretty large and then the product could actually slow down. So there's a lot of things you need to do when it comes to uh, testing a product. It's just not making sure that the, um, you know, that the f features work. There's a lot of other things you need to do also. Well, you've mentioned it to regression, right? For folks that don't understand it, it's retesting everything beforehand to make sure you didn't break anything. Essentially, right? Yeah, exactly. And that's why with regression, you want to automate uh, as that much of that as possible because uh, it's just it just takes too long to do it over and over again. You should focus manual testing on new features until you have that automated. Yeah. So I guess getting into that nowadays, I, I mean, in the past, it seems like with people doing manual tests or being able to just run through and say, I'm going to click here, I'm going to do this, I'm going to do that. You didn't need to be as technical, right, to do that type of stuff. And a lot of people were really... So nowadays with the move towards automation, are you seeing that a lot of people are, you know, getting really proficient in like scripting, say these these like test cases that you guys are doing? Or what, what does someone need to learn to understand test automation nowadays? Yeah, yeah good question. I mean, uh, I know I work at Periton, which is a defense contractor, and we use uh, Python. And when I worked at uh, Google, we use Python too. So nowadays, the opportunities for manual testers who don't know scripting, they're not that good anymore. Uh, a lot of times, uh, managers will hire people only if they have programming skills uh, for QA. Uh, and that makes sense because uh, manual testing is it's kind of like, yes, you have to have manual testing to a certain degree. But uh, in order to really know the product better, if you know the internals and you're doing API testing uh, and things like that, that's actually better because, you know, um, a lot of people before you tested it at the uh, UI level, the, you know, the user interface level. But th by the time you did that, it was kind of too late. The bugs were already in there. So a lot of folks uh, have done this. And, and, you know, the last maybe 20 years, me and my teams have been doing that. We've been testing the SDKs at the API level. So finding issues at the, AP, at the APIs so that the APIs were pretty solid. And then by the time you hit the UI, you know, the, a lot of these bugs wouldn't be there. So doing API SDK testing is really important these days. That makes sense because it's pretty much it majority of the stuff out there is all API driven. Even from exactly. Level. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. And for, for folks that are uh, on here, it's, it's amazing to see how that whole, that whole industry has changed to become, you know, really, I would say, cause I see that a lot where now you'll, you'll see like a title, like software development in S what is it? S S S debt. Yeah, software S development S and test. engineering test. test. Engineering test, yeah. At, at Google, they actually did that for a while, but then they changed it to basically that uh, developers and software QA people are the same now. They're software engineers, which makes sense. So Wait, basically I, the same category now. Well, then it also kind of brings up a, a, a whole – I mean, because, again, there's the whole, there's the whole group that – people know as developer operations or DevOps, the people that are actually managing deployments and things like that. Do you see a world where these just functions start getting more and more just like the same or even merged? Or do you think they're still going to be pretty separate? Um, they might, but I think it's going to take a little while because like an SRE, software reliability engineer, they're basically kind of making sure the cloud is working properly, the servers and stuff like that. And then you got the security specialist and things like that. You know, I think eventually, and it could happen in my lifetime, what I'd love to see happen is uh, uh, QA get smaller and smaller, and basically the developers have better tools so they can actually do, you know, have better code. I think the problem is right now with code quality is not because the developers are not, you know, uh, focused on doing quality work, but because they don't have time to do it right, they take shortcuts. That's what I'm seeing happen. And, you know, their boss might say, oh, you know what, you got a week to do this and the person might need two weeks. And then, 
you know, the person will take shortcuts. Oh, maybe I won't do a detailed code review. Maybe I won't do unit testing and things like that. And uh, then guess what happens? QA finds more bugs. So in the end, you don't save any time at all. You actually probably spend more time because QA is finding more bugs. And then you got to do another release. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah, I, I think... I think between having code tools, even, you know, people using Git and doing check-ins, mm -hmm. a lot of this stuff is actually going to just get better and QA will get smaller. Not even just that, but just even the advent of AI, right? Like yeah, exactly. AI. Exactly. I, that's a good thing, I think, for QA eventually is that once the AI tools really get going, is I can see some of the QA testing will be kind of done by AI. It'll take a while to do, but I definitely see it going in, in that direction eventually. That's what I'd love to see. Cause I always tell developers work me out of a job, but it never happens. And in fact, sometimes I take the developers out to lunch kind of joking. He says, you know, thank you for the job security. I appreciate it. But sometimes you're giving me too much job security. <laughs> <laughs> Is that code word for you got a lot of bugs. <laughs> yeah, I'm, yeah, basically. But it's it's kind of like a mutual, you know, understanding. Yeah, yeah. And I get along really great with the developers. So it's kind of a kind of a joke. But it says, yeah, work me out of a job, please, please. But uh, right now, it's uh, it's probably not going to happen for a while. Which which draws an interesting parallel because in my world, right in the sales side of things, I would say it's probably kind of similar to you, where the really the primary who's like moving stuff forward is the developer, right? Yeah. On my side, it's the account executive. And right. I'm actually, uh, a lot of times I'm supporting the account executive. And a lot of times I feel like on the QA side, right? You're, you are supporting the developer because you're catching anything that they might've made a mistake with. And that's yeah, exactly. And it's a team effort. Like, you know, when I first worked at Apple, when QA, when a bug got out to the customers, they blamed QA and, uh, and yeah, to a certain degree, you know, it, it's true, we missed it. But then again, you know, development put the bug in. So now what I'm seeing now, especially when I worked at Google, it's more of a team effort. You know, yes, QA missed the bug, but development put it in there. So it's a shared responsibility between both teams, yeah, which is nice. Same, same in the same in sort of the sales world where I do is like, yeah, I might be doing the demo or doing the technical discovery, but we all work together as a team. And, you know, exactly. as a team and we, Loses we fail team. as a team. Yeah, exactly. Fails. And that's the way it should be because it's a team effort. And, uh, you know, so that's the one thing I do like nowadays is the collaboration between the development teams and QA and the product manager, the program managers. Uh, if you really have a, a really good product, then that team is going to be really collaborating really well with each other. Yeah, I mean, it makes sense. It makes sense. I mean, I guess, I guess it kind of, in general, with some of the stuff that you've been talking about of how you're seeing stuff, if someone was going to try to get into it, like, are you going to, are, what are you seeing in the market in terms of just in general for QA opportunities going forward? Do you think it's going to lessen or get highly specialized? Like, obviously, automation makes sense for sure. But do you see yeah. more of program management style opportunities where it might be directing AI or directing people, you know, to, to find the areas and how to test? That's a good question because I know when I worked at, uh, got the job at Google, I was a technical program manager for quality. So I wasn't really a quality manager, but I was a TPM for quality. And it was kind of an interesting area because I was dealing with the other uh, TPMs, the development side and everything else. So that's kind of what I see it kind of going now. And definitely companies are hiring a lot more contractors now to do some manual testing. And they're hiring more engineers, employees as being the test automation people. Uh, you definitely need uh, manual testing to a certain degree, but I definitely see uh, manual testing. You know, you if you have our manual tester, you need to have those skills to to do scripting. But the thing is, you to me to find good bugs, you really need to be tenacious and really be a person that wants to break the system. Something that I've always told my people is this, is that you're not there to make to make sure that the product works. You're there to break it. So it's a to different sure mindset. It work. That's right. Yeah. Exactly. So it's a different mindset. And when you have that mindset, then you find more bugs. And uh, but yeah, I, I would say manual testers won't uh, won't go away completely, but they're going to have to know how to do scripting also. Well, it's interesting you mentioned that, too, because I feel like 
at least when I've done professional services stuff and I've worked with testing people who are testing, you know, functionality, at least in the Salesforce world of stuff I was configuring, I find that half of the issues that were logged were mostly just misunderstandings of what the user story was and the use exactly. case. Exactly. And, and it's the same I, thing for a requirement for development in QA. A lot of times it's just a misunderstanding with, uh, yeah, the development team, the product manager, program manager in QA. Yeah. Same. It's all about communication and really going through those requirements and really reviewing them very detailed, you know, in a detailed way, because if the requirements are not correct, it's like the foundation of a, of a house, right? It's not going to be correct. Yeah, been that had to have those conversations like guys, the the, the test case is wrong. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> but then again, sometimes it gets groomed, and what was originally there gets changed. Unfortunately, during the middle of a sprint, even though you're not supposed to, and then <laughs> exactly. Oh yeah, I've I've had days like that where things have changed during the sprint, and uh, but sometimes you have to do that because things change, right? You have to because if you don't do it, and then you oh well, we we're going to do this anyway, then it may not be the right. Re feature for the customer. Totally makes sense. Totally makes sense. Well, I wanted to, uh, I guess, you know, just with some of the time we have left, we're about, you know, 25, almost 30 minutes in, you know, I wanted to kind of just reflect just on your career, right? Like, like, let's talk about, you know, chat about moments that were important to you, you know, like, I, I guess a good one to start with is, what would you say if you reflected on all of your time in tech in Silicon Valley? What's, what's your proudest professional accomplishment? Yeah, yeah, very good question. And I've definitely been out in this uh, field for a while. I kind of kid around with people that I'm old enough. So I tested the first abacus uh, way back. And that was, uh, I didn't have a test plan back then. It was just ad hoc. Anyway, just a little joke there. Um, I think the proudest moments that I've had, honestly, are when I worked at um, Apple, I've had a lot of people that work for me. I, I you know, I, help mentor them and things like that and try to make them grow and some of them right now i mean that and some of them have recently retired but they became directors and vps at apple and they used to work for me so to me having folks that work for you before and uh now they're you know directors vps that's kind of a proud moment for me and especially this when i see on facebook someone gets promoted to director and this has happened a few times now they mention my name uh, thanks, John Gomes, for helping me get to this point. So that's definitely a proud moment for me. And, uh, you know, I want to continue to do that and, you know, mentor people and help people along the way because I've had mentors along the way, too, that helped me. And we're all about mentorship here. And I, I believe that that's, that's, that's one of those things in this industry that's needed is you're, you're not going to know anything until you talk with people who've done something you've done before you know to a certain degree you try to blaze your own trail but sometimes you can't you need to you need to get some directions you know you need to get direction but then i think you too need to do this you need to have a boss uh, mentor that you know empowers you and helps you instead of like telling you okay being a micromanager so you know people out there that are new to management one way to kind of uh, destroy your career is if you micromanage people and, uh, you know, so just focus on, you know, mentoring them, training them, empowering them and providing them the tools to be successful. 100% agree. 100% agree there. Uh, what I, I guess a question for folks, because a lot of people probably listening to this, right, like probably younger. So they when they think of Apple, they maybe go back down to the iPod phase, essentially. Oh, yeah. The 2000s. Yeah. What what was the big thing you were working on back in the 80s? Oh, man. Let's see. We worked on the Mac 2 FX. It was more of a desktop machine. Uh, we used the Motorola chip back then. And then uh, some of the classic Macs that you've seen, the different colors, uh, actually, to the notebook, which was a luggable laptop computer. And actually, let's see... Um, what was the thing that uh, I forgot one of the other things? It was like one of the first, uh, uh, what was it? It's uh, This goes way, way back. But, the Newton? Uh, the Newton, yes. The Newton. I remember the Newton as a kid, yeah. I, I, I had a Newton and I worked on it for a while. I had a friend who worked on that team. And uh, those were the days where, you know, Apple was really trying to really the, you know, be on the leading edge. Unfortunately, Newton wasn't quite ready, 
But you know what? Newton never came out, but then companies like Palm came out and other things. And that was kind of the first thing for having a smart device. And that that's where the smartphones and other things kind of developed from that. So Newton was, was uh, definitely uh, uh, beneficial and helpful and important because it ended up coming, you know, it, it evolved to other types of like the smartphone. Yeah, which has changed everything, which is which is so interesting, because I remember just during the 90s, people were just, people. It was always like, oh, I want a PC because, you know, like the Mac was going through a hard time. And now. it's Oh, like, yeah. I've been using a Mac for work for the past 10 years. And like, it's amazing how that company's turned around and you saw it from the from the beginning. Oh, <laughs> yeah. Especially because when when I worked there, um, we were having layoffs every six months uh jobs wasn't there scully was running the company and uh it you know then i left uh and then um michael spindler he was the uh apple europe president he became uh the president and then um the guy that gil uh, i think his name is gil emilio he was national semiconductors president and he was the guy before jobs so they brought Mm. jobs back and then basically jobs took over and then definitely things were back on track again when jobs came back. Yeah. It's amazing. It's amazing there. Right. I guess in general, you, so you, uh, going from your, I would guess your highs, which your proudest moments, what were your lowest moments or the most stressful? Like, what Yeah. <laughs> yeah. This was one it's interesting. And I always tell people this when I interview. So I worked at a company called ePlanet and we were funded by, um, uh, what was the guy? One of the other founders of uh, Microsoft. Uh, Ballmer? Uh, yes. Ball, no, not Balmer. No, it was Allen. Um, Paul Allen. Paul Allen. Yeah. Ven- uh, Vulcan Ventures was his company. So what we what, what what it was, it was a joint venture with Mattel, Intel and ePlanet to come up with a game. Me Too Cam. Oh, yeah. And I know I think, Dominic, I you played around with it. Yeah. And basically it did background subtraction and you, you know, you were like skiing on, on and you, you know, your body and everything else. It was kind of like, um, you know, the first Xbox you know, connect. Yeah. Yeah. It was actually like, so we were kind of ahead of our time, but unfortunately the technology, the speed wasn't there. It was kind of choppy. The camera quality wasn't too good and things like that. So, you know, we had to make a big decision right before the Christmas holidays. Uh, in fact, it was, uh, I think it was in October or September where we had to make a decision to turn the factories on to start building all this stuff. So the president of the company, and we were all reported to the president, we were really small. And he went to engineering and said, okay, is it ready? And the engineering says, yes. Marketing, are, are we ready? Yes. Sales, are we ready? Yes. And then in the end, he came to me and uh, I said, uh, look, the product's not ready. I have my kids playing with it and, you know, they're, they don't like it. And I have beta testers and it's just not a, it's not a long-term game. Once you do it a couple of times, you don't want to use it anymore and it's crashes. It's, it's not ready. So, you know what? I I think that if we put this out, we're going to have a lot of returns and we're going to look bad. ePlanet's going to look bad. Intel is going to look bad. And so is Mattel. So, you know, he took a, he took a, you know, he took a breath and then he looked around and he said, look, John, you're the only one who was honest with me. And he said that, you know what? I agree. We can't ship this product. Two weeks later, we laid off 80% of the company, including me. That's stressful. But you know what? It was the right thing to do. And um, so that was tough. That was tough because you know what? We laid off people, but eventually the company was going to fold and, you know, I just didn't feel comfortable. And I know the president and other people really deep inside didn't feel comfortable with releasing this product. It would have been terrible. And uh, so we didn't release it. And, uh, but then other technologies came out later, right? Camera quality got better. Like you talked about, you know, these other products, you know, came out. So we were kind of ahead of our time. So, uh, but that was one of my most stressful moments, but, it was the right thing to do. Yeah, because wait, if I remember correctly, you always told me this. You didn't just do that. You also tested. Did you test the ET at Atari? The, the game? I did. I did. And uh, I wasn't the primary <laughs> tester, but yeah, I tested there at Atari. I tested speed reading. And this was on the home computer. 
Yeah. Uh, it was the Atari 400 and the 800. And like I said, that's where I met your uh, your mom. She was the receptionist, and I was a senior test engineer. I tested speed reading, the assembler cartridge, 6502 assembler cartridge, and uh, Dig Dug, Defender. And um, and then, yeah, you know, we when uh, E.T. came out, it was very popular, and uh, Warner Brothers told us, okay, we got to put out this game really quick. So we did. And it was definitely a disaster. Uh, you know, the game was very easy to complete. And uh, yeah, it definitely didn't last too long. But yes, I was one of the testers on E.T. Phone Home. Yeah, that's, that's a little piece of history. And the, the urban legend, which was found out to be true, is they had so many copies of that game that they found it. They buried it in a landfill in New Mexico. Actually. Yeah, yeah, so, exactly. Know. Yeah, and it was interesting. <laughs> Yeah, and it was interesting. The year that I worked there, the first year we had a billion dollars in profit. The next year we lost a billion dollars, and that's when Atari uh, laid off a lot of people, and uh, it never recovered after that. And it should have, because look at the companies nowadays: Nintendo, you got Sony, you got you know, you got all these other platforms now. And Atari, in my opinion, should have still been around. The original Atari. Yeah, it's 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 crazy how stuff comes up like that. And I, I always make the joke that if it wasn't for video games, uh, you know, all of us would make it. <laughs> That's true. And, you know, to this day, I hate playing video games because <laughs> if you actually test them all day, it gets old. Oh, it gets boring. <laughs> yeah, and, and, yeah, and what we had to do, we didn't have a spec. So what we did, if we found a bug, we went to the coin-op machine. And if it occurred there, then it was said, oh, it's just like the coin-op machine. If it wasn't on the coin-op machine – then we actually had to fix it. So the coin out machine was our spec. That's funny. That's funny. Well, well, okay. So I, I guess a couple more questions here and then we'll wrap this up. But um, I guess if looking back at your whole career, if you had a time machine machine and you could go back to any point and change anything, what would it be? Well, yeah, another good question, something to ponder here. Well, I wish I was a bit more technical where I was, you know, more of a computer science person where I did some programming, did some automation and things like that. I was really more of a manager, a project manager, and basically coming up with test plans, directions, you know, given uh, strategies and things like that for testing. But in a way, I wish I was was more technical and maybe got a computer science degree. I, I ended up getting a master's in cybersecurity, which is in the, a technical degree, but uh, I really wanted to get a computer science degree and, and get a master's in computer science also. So I just wish I was a little more technical. You, you and me both. I, I, I go back and I'm like, why did I study political science? The, the best thing I got out of political science was I found Luisa, my wife. So yeah, yeah, happens for a reason. Yeah, that's <laughs> like with Kathleen. You know, your mom, same thing. She really uh, had a lot to do with, uh, I think, my uh, career and everything else. And you know, all of you too, all the children, right? And uh, you know, it's just interesting now talking to you. You know, you were. I remember when you were just a little guy with curly hair. Yes. Dominic had hair before. Yeah, uh, uh, yeah. Now I'm. Bald, and I and so. I did too. I had hair. Before <laughs> <too>. <laughs> um. All right. We'll, we'll we'll do one more last more, and then we'll wrap this up. But you know, again, one of the biggest things in my uh, segment is normally we always talk about the importance of you know mentoring. Like, mm -hmm. if you were gonna pick who was the most influential person that mentored you or like really got you to where you're at, like who would it be? And, you know, um, how, how do they influence you? Yeah. Um, and this goes kind of way back. Um, I was in the California Air National Guard, which is part of the reserves and uh, my NCOIC, which is non-commissioned officer in charge, my, my supervisor, guy named Mas Senior Master Sergeant uh, Joaquin Preciado. And um, tough guy, but he was really fair. Um, and, you know, he told you how it was. If you didn't do a good job, he would tell you. If you did a good job, he would tell you. And I remember one day I was working in, I was, uh, I was a computer operator at the uh, 129th at Moffett Field. And uh, some colonel came in and was looking for a listing. Back then we didn't have like uh, laptops or uh, computers initially. People got their printouts from our computer center. 
So he was looking for a listing and he couldn't find it and he was yelling at me. And I, you know, I was just standing there listening to him. And then uh, Press, uh, Sergeant Preciado starts saying, hey, don't you be yelling at my people. If anyone needs to yell at them, I'll do it. And, you know, after the after the colonel would left and I couldn't believe it because a, a, a sergeant uh, basically telling a colonel off, you know, in some places you basically can get court martialed for that. But this guy was that kind of guy. So so basically what I'm saying here, he really protected his people. He looked after his people. And, you know, at the end of the day, you got to protect your people. And, you know, even if they're wrong, you know, out in the open when there's a meeting and stuff like that, you say, well, okay, let's talk about this offline. I mean, I've seen managers that kind of have yelled at people out in the open in meetings and you don't do that. So what I learned from um, Sergeant Preciano is take care of your people. They'll take care of me, of you and the team. And to this day, I've always remembered what he did. And uh, I still try to take care of my people, even when they're wrong. That's that is amazing advice for, you know, aspiring managers or people that are starting management just in general of like protecting your people. Like that's, yeah. that's always what I look for too as well. Like the, the best managers I've had have always been empathetic, but they've always stuck up for you. Even if, even if you make a mistake, right? Like, yeah, exactly. We're all human. We're going to make mistakes. You we're know? all going <laughs> to make mistakes. Now, if they keep on happening, of course, you got to say, Hey, you know, you got to get to the bottom of it because, you know, if there's stuff that needs to be improved, you need to focus on that, you know, but yeah, you do it in a polite and a respectful way. That's great. Oh, that's great. Like, uh, I feel like I've learned a lot from you, dad, and I've known you my whole life. So it's, it's that's interesting. true. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And I've known you all my life. <laughs> <laughs> well, at least half my life, right? All, all my, all my life, all my life. You know. <laughs> but but yeah, no, um, I guess any any parting thoughts or, you know, any advice you would give someone who's brand stinking new, wants to make like a career change. Maybe they, they haven't been in the military or maybe they're, they've are they gone to the military or they're doing something completely different and they want to get an attack. Any advice you would give people that are trying to make the transition into this industry right now? I mean, definitely LinkedIn is definitely one of them. Get on LinkedIn, uh, you know, build your uh, contact base. Uh, and do something that you really like that is fun. You know, have fun with it. I know some of these jobs can be stressful. Any job is stressful, even if it's fun most of the time. But, you know, so have fun with it. Uh, always be in a mode where you want to learn. Uh, work well with others. Because if you can't work well with others, but you, you know the, you know, you're technical, you're, gonna, you're not going to succeed if you can't get along with others. So definitely your soft skills are important. Your technical skills are important, too. But your interaction uh, interaction skills are more important. Perfect. I 100% co-sign and agree with everything you just said. And it's funny you mentioned LinkedIn because, like I said, uh, a lot of a lot of the reasons. And you I worked there. This. Well, yeah, yeah, I worked there. But, uh, yeah, which is another story for a different day. But it's it's uh, LinkedIn has really been uh, probably outside of just meeting people the biggest tool that's gotten to me all my positions. Where yeah, it's a happy. really good tool and I still use it to this day and uh, yeah, I'll continue to use it even after I retire. All right, everyone. Well, hey, thank you audience for listening to, uh, you know, a son talk to his father uh, on this uh, episode of Conversations with Dom and, uh, you know, please remember to subscribe to I'm Breaking Into Tech and uh, feel free to reach out to my dad uh, on LinkedIn. <laughs> All right, everyone.